Good morning. How are you? I'm Sherman Stanford, and this is Making Sense of the Chaos. <clears throat> Every day we try to talk about God, His world, um, and how to, how to understand what's going on in the world. Um, as I was walking this morning, it occurred to me that maybe I need to uh, simplify this just a little bit. <clears throat> There's a, a sense in which broadly there are really only two ways of looking at uh, everything in the cosmos, just two, okay? Uh, now, it's true that one of those two ways has a lot of external frills and frou-frous um, for different aspects or, or different uh, um, focuses within that larger group, uh, but basically, if you get down to the nitty-gritty, to the mechanics <clears throat> of what's really going on, there essentially are only two ways to look at all of the world. One is you look at it as well as you can through God's eyes, and you try to understand why He created everything, what His purpose is, and you, and you center it all around Him, uh, that the reason for the creation is for God and His glory, or you see it, the reason of the creation all about man. It's for man and his use, his glory, his whatever, okay? But if man is the, is the purpose of the creation, you're going to see every factor in the creation one way. But if God and his glory is the purpose of the creation, you're going to see it a whole different way. Now, the confusion comes, first of all, for those who want to see it as created by God for his glory, when we mix up parts of that world and life view with the other world and life view. Because then what you're going to have is a mishmash. <clears throat> and so you're going to have conflicting ideas, and that's just going to create a lot of confusion. Now, on the other side, the other camp, <clears throat> you're, going, you're going to have a lot of confusion because it simply doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make mathematical sense for the creation to have... Uh, to exist for man's purposes, for man to be the center of the whole creation, for, <clears throat> for him to be God, essentially. Um, I mean, clearly, he didn't create the creation. Something had to create it. And whatever created it has to be larger than the creation, more powerful, more intelligent. It has to be self-existent. Uh, it, it cannot have come into existence because then it would need something to have prompted it to come into existence. It's fundamental philosophical truths. Uh, you have to have an ultimate self-existent truth. The universe is not the ultimate self-existent truth. We know that. So there has to be something else. Now, if, if all of that's pointing to God, and it is, then it's nonsense to choose to believe there is no God. <clears throat> now, because there is a God, and because he created all that is, then in order to make mathematical sense of why he created everything, we, could, we can set it up as sort of an equation. We have uh, <clears throat> God on this side, okay? Now, he creates the cosmos on this side. Now, his reason for creating the cosmos has to be equal in some way to who he is. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Why would God create something that is his supreme masterpiece that reflects less than himself? Does that make any sense? Because I can't make that make any sense to me. Now, if it's going to reflect who he is, it has to be devoted to his glory. It cannot be devoted to man's glory. It cannot be set up with man as the centerpiece the purpose for which everything exists. No, God's glory has to be the purpose for which everything exists. And you know, when you see it that way, it's not real hard to see also the basic division that we make every day between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. If you see things from God's perspective, then you're seeing it from the seed of the woman's perspective. If you see it from man's perspective, as man is the focus of the creation, then that's a mentality of the seed of the serpent. 
And those two ways of viewing the world are utterly incompatible. They are at war with one another. Just as God put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, there is war between the two mentalities. Now, if you look at your, your mind, your thought world, the way that you view the world, if, if you have to admit that you see man as the purpose for everything and man's uh, sovereignty, man's free will, man's this, man's that, as the real purpose for everything that God's doing, then mentally you belong in the seed of the serpent. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't saved. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it as a man thinketh, so is he. That's what Proverbs 24, 7, I think it is, says. And ultimately, how you think is going to work itself out in how you act. For a while, you can think one way and act another. But over time, our actions become consistent with our thinking because that's what God says. We're made in his image. Anyway, as, as, a, as a broad overview, a way of thinking, this is how I want you to be looking at things, because this is the truth. And when you look at things that way, you'll be able to make sense of things that otherwise just seem to be whizzing by at uh, supersonic speed in all kinds of directions, and you, and, and you can't grab an idea and uh, make concrete sense of it. Now, having said all that, let me get to our seven fundamental um, building blocks for our reality. First, God created the cosmos for His glory, not for man's. Okay, <laughs> I, I imagine that you that you got that idea from everything I've said so far. Second, the jewel of creation is man. And so we're not trying to say that man is unimportant. Man is. Number two, he comes in right unto God. God created man as the highest form under him. But under him, under him, for God's glory, not man's. Third, although in no sense the author of evil, God, because he is the sovereign creator and because everything exists for his glory, nothing can happen that he's not in charge of ordained Adam's fall. But he's not the author of evil. He didn't force Adam to fall. He ordained that he would fall. Now, how, how did he manage that? The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't know. And uh, I could speculate, but it would just be idle speculation and would help no one, not me, not you. So I just leave that alone. Trust God. He knows what he's doing. I don't. Am I going to come up with a better plan? Uh, no. Fourth, in Adam, the entire creation fell. Both Adam and Eve, all of their progeny to come, children, grandchildren, great, 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 great grandchildren, to, down to you and me and our children and our children's children until the end of time. And included in that fall was the cosmos itself. Remember, Paul says the creation groans awaiting its redemption. Fifth, as a result of the fall, and this is, this is a, a big point as well, just went over it quite, in quite a bit of detail, God pronounced the curse of enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Humanity is divided into two great divisions. If you do not believe that's true, then you have not read the Bible with open eyes trying to see what God has said. But Genesis 3.15 from there to the end, there's always this division between God's chosen people and the rest of the world. It's there all over the place. You see it in John 8, where Jesus tells the Pharisees that they're not children of, their, of, of Abraham. They're children of their father, Satan. Well... Gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Hmm. Yes, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He said that. Anyway, this, these two great divisions that are at enmity with, another, with, one, with one another, uh, are, this is known as the great antithesis. <clears throat> the sixth point we'll make is that 
all human history is an outworking of this great antithesis. Everything that happens, everything that happens is a reflection of that great antithesis. And you're playing a part in it. What part are you playing? Well, either a faithful part as a part of the seed of the woman or an unfaithful part as part of the seed of the serpent or as an as a, as a less than faithful part of the seed of the woman. But you're playing a part. Seventh, the seed of the serpent, those who remain obdurately unrepentant until they die. They have no excuse. Okay? Paul tells us that God has revealed himself to them, inside them, and in the creation all around them. They see him unmistakably, but they suppress the truth in culpable self-deceit. All right? That's in Romans 1. Now, we've been talking about God's providence and uh, that God's providence rests squarely on the idea of his foreordaining every detail in his creation, that he could not possibly be a providential God, that he could not tell anyone that all things work together for their good if he's not in charge of everything, if he's not in control of everything. How is he going to say that and deliver the goods? And you can say that, I can say that, and then we fail. And people say, well, my goodness, look, look, look what Sherm said. Look what you said. You couldn't deliver that. But then nobody thinks I can. Nobody thinks you can. If I told you right now that I got everything in control for your life, that everything is going to work copacetically. It's just going to be wonderful this, from this point on because I have everything in charge. Look at these hands. I've got your life in these hands, and you're all right now. Don't worry. You put all your worries down and say, I don't have anything to worry about because there's old Sherm. He's going to take care of me forever. And you'd ignore the fact that I'm 73 years old, and I'm probably not going to live another 73 years or however long you're planning to live to take care of you. you no, you'd ignore all that, and you'd ignore the fact that I'm just a man, and, and uh, I make mistakes, and I, I run out of power, uh, I run out of ability, uh, and uh, I, I can't even make my own life work out well. But I'm going to make your life work out well, right? No. No. You wouldn't believe me, and you shouldn't believe me. Now, when God says, don't worry about it, my child, I have every detail of your life in my hands, and I'm working it out for your good. If we're going to trust that statement, then there are certain truths that have to exist. He has to he has to be uh, uh, omnipotent. He has to be omniscient. Uh, he cannot be a changeable God. Okay? Now, if we're going to deny that he has um, providential, foreordaining control of every event in, in, in the world, then we have to deny his omniscience, deny his omnipotence, deny his immutability, and we have to deal with all the consequences of doing that. That is now... We have a God who can't deliver on that promise, and he's made the promise. So now you have a guy, a God who is, at the very best, mistaken, and at the very worst, a liar. Well, good. You go ahead and worship the mistaken God or the lying God. I am going to worship a God I do not think makes a mistake, nor does he lie. Well, why do I think that? What am I supposed to think? Okay, that uh, everything he said cannot be trusted? Because if one thing that he said cannot be trusted, then nothing that he said can be trusted. You understand that? You, you can't say, well, oh, he said this one thing that I can't trust, but I can trust everything else. Remember, trust is a, a almost, it's an invisible filament, very small, very slight, but it holds great weight until you break it. What does it take, take to break it? How many times do I have to lie to you before you decide I'm a liar and can't be trusted? Let me guess. Once. Yes, once. Once. After that, you can't trust me. How often does your alarm clock have to fail to go off in the morning before you no longer trust it to wake you at the time it should? Uh, let me guess. Once. No, trust, tr trust is, you either trust people or you don't. Okay? Now, 
you may say, oh, I'm not sure I can trust that person, so I'm going to trust but verify, as, as President Reagan said to the, to the Russians, which of course meant he didn't trust them at all. <laughs> That's what it really meant. And I don't think it fooled the Russians. <laughs> I've heard people say that since then, trust but verify. But the truth is, when you trust, you don't have to verify. <laughs> It was a very clever way of saying, I don't trust you. <laughs> anyway, what other consequences are there to denying God's providential control of every event, every event throughout time? Well, it casts men adrift on the seas of fate and chance. Denying that God sovereignly predestines every event makes man responsible, but impotent. Got no power. Okay. How is he going to make anything work out? How are you? How am I? Okay? <laughs> if you haven't realized how weak and frail you are yet, you haven't lived very long. Fortunately, I've lived a long time, and I have seen my frailties in living color repeated over and over again. So I don't have to be convinced that I'm pretty impotent. I, I, I see it. And... Uh, you know, others might say, well, look, you, know, you seem to have had a lot more power in your life than most people. Well, a lot more power, once again, we're, we're back to the, uh, to the image of the, the, the land of the three-foot midgets. And so there's, there's one guy over there who's three-foot six, and we say, wow, what a giant. Well, in a land of three-foot midgets, maybe you are a giant. But <clears throat> is this something you're going to write home about to brag? Hey, I'm three foot six. Well, okay, what does that mean? It means, it means you're pretty weak and powerless. Since denying that God sovereignly controls events necessarily places that control either in man himself or in fate or chance, what's left? What's left? Okay, there's no other God out there. Okay, so, so if you claim to worship some other God out there, it's... It's either a projection of yourself, okay, or it's fate or chance. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. I mean, <clears throat> if you're going to make a, a wooden image or a marble image or whatever and go worship that, well, you made it. Or other men made it. It's a projection of humanity. Weak, frail, fallen human beings. Impotent human beings. Okay? <clears throat> or it's fate or chance. One of those has to be in control. Man then may be viewed as a responsible creature, but a creature abandoned to his own devices as he faces fate and chance, forces over which he has no control. What control do you have over the turn of the next card? I mean, unless you stack the deck. If you load the dice, you may know how they're going to come down. But you can't load the dice, you can't stack the deck of time. Okay? What's going to happen in the next moment? You cannot know. You cannot know and you cannot control. And the more that you try to control, the more paranoid and frenzied you become. Okay? And the nuttier you get. Because you're trying to climb a place you can't climb. You can't climb there. He's reduced then to saying, as modern man does, with a hopeless shrug of his shoulders, poop happens. Oh, they don't say poop. If events are ultimately controlled by fate or chance, then man is subject... Listen to this, because this is where... He... This, th these are your choices, okay? Subject to the whims of chance or the implacable hostility of impersonal fate, which... Because they are directed by no intelligence, no orderly plan, no personal God, leave him helplessly tossed to and fro. I mean, go gamble. You win, you lose, you have no way of knowing which one. Okay? And you're always waiting on the next turn of the cards or the, the you know, the next. Um, throw of the dice, or whatever. But there's no perceivable rhyme or reason, no control. It's then useless for you to plan. 
if, if you're tossed about on the winds of fate and chance, why plan? You can't make your plans turn out. You have no control over it, nor is there anyone that you can turn to who does. You have no personal God who's in charge of every detail. Remember, you've, you've given that up. Now, now everything has to hinge on some man or men controlling everything, which you know they cannot do. They cannot do. Look, in our own country, we're trying to control a silly little disease, and we haven't been able to control that. We've just been able to ruin our economy and send people plunging into despair, which has resulted in their suicides. Yes, we, we managed, to, managed to control that. See how we muck, muck up everything that we try to do? When we pretend to be gods? The facts, factors to be considered in bringing any plan to its end are completely random for that man. Infinitely complex. Almost all far beyond his control and they are malevolent, evil. They, they, they're not his friend. Okay? Chance is not your friend. Fate is not your friend. It's just this thing that happens. And if you step in the front of that truck that's coming, fate says it's going to run right over you and leave you a bloody mess on the highway. If this picture triggers a familiar echo in your mind... It is because ideas have consequences. And the idea of the cosmos existing outside of the personal direct control of God has led us into a hopeless mental labyrinth. What's a labyrinth? Well, it's a maze. It's a, you might see it as a system of, of tunnels that go all over the place and who knows where. And you get lost in them. You can't find your way out. Okay? Well, that's where we are. In pursuing a humanist agenda, as we seek to deify man's quote-unquote free will, the biblical truths that we must ignore or deny in order to pursue that agenda must be replaced by unbiblical lies. Denial of God's sovereign control of every detail of his unfolding plan for his creation in favor of man's quote-unquote free will decision regarding his own salvation has produced the mentality of postmodernism. Okay, which denies truth. Is it true? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, so there is truth. Mm. And unsurprisingly, it has given rise to a hopeless, whining victimhood culture. And it has. Open your eyes. Ouvre tes yeux. Okay? Open your eyes. And you'll see. That's all around us. All around us. All around us. I was talking to someone just the other night. Whining, whining, whining. Feeling sorry for herself. Whining. Mm. If God is stipulated as having no control over future events, then praying to him is rendered pointless. Why would you pray to a guy who has no control over anything? Hmm? If, if, if man is in charge of his own destiny. God is not necessary. And God certainly can't be prayed to to change men's hearts or to control the evil they would do. So the only reason to pray then is to psychologically calm yourself. It's just, you know, repeating a mantra. Um, um, um. You know, we can, we can achieve psychological effects in ourselves by doing all these ritualistic things sure we can sure we can but what effect is that going to have on the real world is it going to really change anything there's a possibility it may get you in touch with the forces of darkness of evil and that they may be able to change some things in your life but it's very unlikely they'll change them for the better isn't it yes i, I turn to satan for my peace and my harmony in life Yes, I harmonize everything with Satan. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. <clears throat> but having this attitude, there's no logical reason to pray for God's providential superintendence over our lives if we admit that events occur outside of his control, nullifying as it does the very concept of divine providential superintendence. If, on the other hand, events are ultimately controlled by men and not by God, Yet if men remain responsible to God for the things they do, 
then men, spiritually dead in sin, are in the unenviable position of having to meet God's standard of righteousness without God's direct intervention as an assisting lifeline. That's what you want. That's what you get. Okay? That's part of the price of insisting on man's self-will instead of submitting man's will to God's will. God. God is God, not men. God is in charge of everything, not men. God brings his plan to pass in intimate, uh, minute detail, not men. He doesn't leave things open-ended and say, okay, now you guys, you guys take care of this. It's going to be up to you. Because as soon as he leaves anything open-ended, you understand everything becomes open-ended. Everything. You can't have some things that are outside of, uh, of God's control and him then remain in control of other things. You cannot have that because there's nothing that occurs that exists outside of all other things that are happening. Everything is connected. It's all a mosaic. It's all a weave. Everything is weaved together in your life, in my life, in everyone's life. If you don't see that, you're just blinding yourself. They cannot have it both ways. There's a fundamental cognitive dissonance that must be resolved, or like corrosive acid, it will undermine the stanchions of reality, ending in paralyzing ambivalence. Okay? Am I in charge? Am I not in charge? Can I do this? Can I not do this? And you know, you're two, man, two minds, and you, and you can't decide which way to go? That's where you end up. Logically, they cannot assert human sovereignty and then call on God to intervene in the lives of rebels, asking him to override or limit their sovereign wills to extend his salvation to them as well. I mean, look, if men are sovereign over their ultimate fate, if it is their free will decisions that determine whether they're saved or lost, not God's free will decision on who to choose and who to leave in their sins, if it's man's free will decisions that determine it, then it makes no sense to pray to God that he would change their hearts. Isn't the whole idea that they're free to do whatever they want? Why would we think that man, that God then can change their hearts? If God can change their hearts, they, then they're not the ones in charge. Duh. Am I missing something here? Oh, God's in charge and they're in charge. No, 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 no. Remember now, you can't have two people or two, two agencies in charge of a single thing. You cannot. It doesn't work. Okay, it does not work. What happens when they disagree? Who gets to break the tie? Well, if you say, well, but man gets to break the tie. Well, if man gets to break the tie, then man the boss. That's the way it is. Whoever gets to break the tie is the boss. And there has to be a boss in every, in every arrangement uh, involving any authority at all and more than one person. There has to be a boss. If, if, if it's a, an authoritative arrangement, involving two or more people, somebody has to be in charge. Or else, they disintegrate. They, they stay together as long as they can all agree. Well, how long will that be? Mm, who knows? Who knows? <clears throat> that man who insists on man's free will as sovereign, he can't even ask God to limit or control to any degree the evil others might do. Okay? Lord, please protect my child. Well, protect my child from what? From whom? If, if I'm asking God to protect my child from the evil other men will do, then I'm asking God to curb or limit the evil they would do. But I thought I believed in man's free will. Well, how, how does God control their free will choices to do evil against my child? Obviously, if man's free will is running the universe, running amok, then... God doesn't have control over the free wills of those men. But if you, if you presume that God has control over the free wills of those men, then he has control over the free wills of those men all the time. And they have no free wills that are outside of his control. Okay? This is not complicated. If men are in control of events, then God is not. If God is in control of events, then men are not. Because they assert that men are in control, then by the implacable force of logic, God 
God's denying, uh, denying God's predestining providence leaves no remaining room for God's sovereign control. That's just the way it is. Okay, we still have a little more of this to go, and we'll pick that up tomorrow morning, and then we'll move on to some other subjects. Uh, I trust that God uh, gave you a good night's sleep last night, and that he will guard you and keep you and protect you today from all harm, not just coronavirus, which, quite frankly, in the scale of dangers facing all of humanity, is pretty small. Pretty small. Um, the dangers facing us by our unfaithfulness to God are far greater than any harms that can come to us naturally. Just, it's crazy. Anyway, um, Bill, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I just pray also for the, uh, the, the calmness to prevail in, a, in light of possible protests that are being uh, in our country. Yes, well, that, 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 that's a good point. Uh, this thing that happened over in uh, Minneapolis, is it? Because mm -hmm. there, there's different riots or different. And, uh, and, and, and the riots that came out of it, um, it's pretty obvious when you look at the, the video that the police officer was without justification for what he did. Now, to, to assume from a particular general conclusions is nonsense. Okay? It violates the laws of logic. Okay? Uh, the fact that one person does something does not mean anything necessarily about what all people would do. It does not, the fact that he has a certain attitude about what he did or about other people uh, is no necessary uh, indicator of anyone else who has that attitude or how many others who have that attitude. And so reacting against one man's uh, injustice by being promiscuously unjust to many men is simply irrational nonsense, okay? To, uh, to riot in protest against injustice is to promulgate injustice as a salve to heal injustice. Does that make any sense? And even to say, well, you understand that uh, these people have a grievance. Well, they may have a grievance. Okay? Well, let's talk about the grievance. But to respond to a grievance you have in an unjust way doesn't uh, correct the, the situation for which you have a, a grievance over. It just creates another grief over which there will be other grievances by other people. And the thing goes on and on forever. So let's examine our own minds, our own thinking, and be sure that we don't fall victim to those things. Uh, listen, we're all made in the image of God, and because we bear that image, we all have great value. And we're supposed to give to every other image bearer the presumption that they are more valuable than ourselves. Every other image bearer, everyone. It doesn't matter if I'm in the seat of the woman and I'm looking at someone in the seat of the serpent. I'm to regard them as more valuable than myself. I am to be charitable and loving and giving to everyone. I'm to think the best of everyone. Now, I have to remember to, to, to make a judgment about where people fit, but that doesn't mean that I hate them. It doesn't. I, I'm not allowed to do that, nor are you. And I'm not allowed to characterize somebody based upon some incidental characteristic of theirs <laughs> as far as their character or their, or their uh, um, value as human beings. Okay? The color of our skin, the, uh, where we live, um, and what we believe, none of those things add more or less value to us as human beings. And, and for us to, to make that mistake is fundamentally wrong according to God and it's simply uh, insupportable. So, my two cents, for whatever that's worth.
probably worth about a penny, huh? About two cents worth. Anyway, God bless you. And I hope you have a wonderful day. And I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you.